Chapter 3 Maldonado July 5, 1832 In the morning we got under way, and stood out of the splendid harbor of Rio de Janeiro. In our passage to the Plata, we saw nothing particular, excepting on one day a great shoal of porpoises, many hundreds in number. The whole sea was in places furrowed by them, and a most extraordinary spectacle was presented, as hundreds, proceeding together by jumps, in which their whole bodies were exposed, thus cut the water. When the ship was running nine knots an hour, these animals could cross and recross the bows with the greatest of ease, and then dash away right ahead. As soon as we entered the estuary of the Plata, the weather was very unsettled. One dark night we were surrounded by numerous seals and penguins, which made such strange noises, that the officer on watch reported he could hear the cattle bellowing on shore. On a second night we witnessed a splendid scene of natural fireworks, the masthead and yard armaments shone with St. Elmo's light, and the form of the vein could almost be traced, as if it had been rubbed with phosphorus. The sea was so highly luminous, that the tracks of the penguins were marked by a fiery wake, and the darkness of the sky was momentarily illuminated by the most vivid lightning. When within the mouth of the river, I was interested by observing how slowly the waters of the sea and river mixed. The latter, muddy and discolored, from its less specific gravity, floated on the surface of the salt water. This was curiously exhibited in the wake of the vessel, where a line of blue water was seen mingling in little eddies, with the adjoining fluid. July 26, we anchored at Montevideo. The Beagle was employed in surveying the extreme southern and eastern coasts of America, south of the Plata, during the two succeeding years. To prevent useless repetitions, I will extract those parts of my journal which refer to the same districts without always attending to the order in which we visited them. Maldonado is situated on the northern bank of the Plata, and not very far from the mouth of the estuary. It is a most quiet, forlorn, little town, built, as is universally the case in these countries, with the streets running at right angles to each other, and having in the middle a large plaza or square, which, from its size, renders the scantiness of the population more evident. It possesses scarcely any trade the exports being confined to a few hides and living cattle. The inhabitants are chiefly landowners, together with a few shopkeepers and the necessary tradesmen, such as blacksmiths and carpenters, who do nearly all the business for a circuit of 50 miles round. The town is separated from the river by a band of sand hillocks, about a mile broad, it is surrounded, on all other sides, by an open slightly undulating country, covered by one uniform layer of fine green turf, on which countless herds of cattle, sheep, and horses graze. There is very little land cultivated even close to the town. A few hedges, made of cacti and agave, mark out where some wheat or Indian corn has been planted. The features of the country are very similar along the whole northern bank of the Plata. The only difference is, that here the granitic hills are a little bolder. The scenery is very uninteresting, there is scarcely a house, an enclosed piece of ground, or even a tree, to give it an air of cheerfulness yet, after being imprisoned for some time in a ship, there is a charm in the unconfined feeling of walking over boundless plains of turf. Moreover, if your view is limited to a small space, many objects possess beauty. Some of the smaller birds are brilliantly colored, and the bright green sward, browsed short by the cattle, is ornamented by dwarf flowers, among which a plant, looking like the daisy, claimed the place of an old friend. What would a florist say to whole tracts, so thickly covered by the verbena meliendiars, as, even at a distance, to appear of the most gaudy scarlet? I stayed ten weeks at Maldonado, in which time a nearly perfect collection of the animals, birds, and reptiles, was procured. Before making any observations respecting them, I will give an account of a little excursion I made as far as the river Polanco, which is about 70 miles distant, in a northerly direction. I may mention, as a proof how cheap everything is in this country, that I paid only $2 a day, or 8 shillings, for two men, 
together with a troop of about a dozen riding horses. My companions were well armed with pistols and sabers, a precaution which I thought rather unnecessary, but the first piece of news we heard was, that, the day before, a traveler from Montevideo had been found dead on the road, with his throat cut. This happened close to a cross, the record of a former murder. On the first night we slept at a retired little country house, and there I soon found out that I possessed two or three articles, especially a pocket compass, which created unbounded astonishment. In every house I was asked to show the compass, and by its aid, together with a map, to point out the direction of various places. It excited the liveliest admiration that I, a perfect stranger, should know the road, for direction and road are synonymous in this open country, to places where I had never been. At one house a young woman, who was ill in bed, sent to entreat me to come and show her the compass. If their surprise was great, mine was greater, to find such ignorance among people who possessed their thousands of cattle, and estancias of great extent. It can only be accounted for by the circumstance that this retired part of the country is seldom visited by foreigners. I was asked whether the earth or sun moved, whether it was hotter or colder to the north, where Spain was, and many other such questions. The greater number of the inhabitants had an indistinct idea that England, London, and North America, were different names for the same place, but the better informed well knew that London and North America were separate countries close together, and that England was a large town in London. I carried with me some Promethean matches, which I ignited by biting, it was thought so wonderful that a man should strike fire with his teeth, that it was usual to collect the whole family to see it, I was once offered a dollar for a single one. Washing my face in the morning cost much speculation at the village of Las Minas, a superior tradesman closely cross-questioned me about so singular a practice, and likewise why on board we wore our beards, for he had heard from my guide that we did so. He eyed me with much suspicion, perhaps he had heard of ablutions in the Mahometan religion, and knowing me to be a heretic, probably he came to the conclusion that all heretics were Turks. It is the general custom in this country to ask for a night's lodging at the first convenient house. The astonishment at the compass, and my other feats of jugglery, was to a certain degree advantageous, as with that, and the long stories my guides told of my breaking stones, knowing venomous from harmless snakes, collecting insects, etc., I repaid them for their hospitality. I am writing as if I had been among the inhabitants of Central Africa, Banda Oriental would not be flattered by the comparison, but such were my feelings at the time. The next day we rode to the village of Las Minas. The country was rather more hilly, but otherwise continued the same, an inhabitant of the Pampas no doubt would have considered it as truly alpine. The country is so thinly inhabited, that during the whole day we scarcely met a single person. Las Minas is much smaller even than Maldonado. It is seated on a little plain, and is surrounded by low rocky mountains. It is of the usual symmetrical form, and with its whitewashed church standing in the center, had rather a pretty appearance. The outskirting houses rose out of the plain like isolated beings, without the accompaniment of gardens or courtyards. This is generally the case in the country, and all the houses have, in consequence an uncomfortable aspect. At night we stopped at a pulp area, or drinking shop. During the evening a great number of gauchos came in to drink spirits and smoke cigars, their appearance is very striking, they are generally tall and handsome, but with a proud and dissolute expression of countenance. They frequently wear their mustaches and long black hair curling down their backs. With their brightly colored garments, great spurs clanking about their heels, and knives stuck as daggers, and often so used, at their waists, they look a very different race of men from what might be expected from their name of gauchos, or simple countrymen. Their politeness is excessive, they never drink their spirits without expecting you to taste it, but whilst making their exceedingly graceful bow, they seem quite as ready, if occasion offered, to cut your throat. On the third day we pursued rather an irregular course, 
as I was employed in examining some beds of marble. On the fine plains of turf we saw many ostriches. Some of the flocks contained as many as twenty or thirty birds. These, when standing on any little eminence, and seen against the clear sky, presented a very noble appearance. I never met with such tame ostriches in any other part of the country, it was easy to gallop up within a short distance of them, but then, expanding their wings, they made all sail right before the wind, and soon left the horse's stern. At night we came to the house of Don Juan Fuentes, a rich landed proprietor, but not personally known to either of my companions. On approaching the house of a stranger, it is usual to follow several little points of etiquette, riding up slowly to the door, the salutation of Ave Maria is given, and until somebody comes out and asks you to alight, it is not customary even to get off your horse, the formal answer of the owner is, sin peccato concebita that is, conceived without sin. Having entered the house, some general conversation is kept up for a few minutes, till permission is asked to pass the night there. This is granted as a matter of course. The stranger then takes his meals with the family, and a room is assigned him, where with the horse cloths belonging to his recado, or saddle of the pampas, he makes his bed. It is curious how similar circumstances produce such similar results in manners. At the Cape of Good Hope the same hospitality, and very nearly the same points of etiquette, are universally observed. The difference, however, between the character of the Spaniard and that of the Dutch boar is shown, by the former never asking his guest a single question beyond the strictest rule of politeness, whilst the honest Dutchman demands where he has been, where he is going, what is his business, and even how many brothers, sisters, or children he may happen to have. Shortly after our arrival at Don Juan's, one of the largest herds of cattle was driven in towards the house, and three beasts were picked out to be slaughtered for the supply of the establishment. These half-wild cattle are very active, and knowing full well the fatal lazo, they led the horses along in laborious chase. After witnessing the rude wealth displayed in the number of cattle, men, and horses, Don Juan's miserable house was quite curious. The floor consisted of hardened mud, and the windows were without glass, the sitting room boasted only of a few of the roughest chairs and stools, with a couple of tables. The supper, although several strangers were present, consisted of two huge piles, one of roast beef, the other of boiled, with some pieces of pumpkin, besides this latter there was no other vegetable, and not even a morsel of bread. For drinking, a large earthenware jug of water served the whole party. Yet this man was the owner of several square miles of land, of which nearly every acre would produce corn, and, with a little trouble, all the common vegetables. The evening was spent in smoking, with a little impromptu singing, accompanied by the guitar. The senoritas all sat together in one corner of the room, and did not sup with the men. So many works have been written about these countries, that it is almost superfluous to describe either the lasso or the bullace. The lasso consists of a very strong, but thin, well-plated rope, made of rawhide. One end is attached to the broad single, which fastens together the complicated gear of the recado, or saddle used in the pampas, the other is terminated by a small ring of iron or brass, by which a noose can be formed. The gaucho, when he is going to use the lazo, keeps a small coil in his bridle hand, and in the other holds the running noose which is made very large, generally having a diameter of about eight feet. This he whirls round his head, and by the dexterous movement of his wrist keeps the noose open, then, throwing it, he causes it to fall on any particular spot he chooses. The lazo, when not used, is tied up in a small coil to the after part of the recado. The bullas, or balls, are of two kinds, the simplest, which is chiefly used for catching ostriches, consists of two round stones, covered with leather, and united by a thin plated thong, about eight feet long. The other kind differs only in having three balls united by the thongs to a common center. The gaucho holds the smallest of the three in his hand, and whirls the other two round and round his head, then, 
taking aim, sends them like chain shot revolving through the air. The balls no sooner strike any object, than, winding round it, they cross each other, and become firmly hitched. The size and weight of the balls vary, according to the purpose for which they are made, when of stone, although not larger than an apple, they are sent with such force as sometimes to break the leg even of a horse. I have seen the balls made of wood, and as large as a turnip, for the sake of catching these animals without injuring them. The balls are sometimes made of iron, and these can be hurled to the greatest distance. The main difficulty in using either lazo or bullis is to ride so well as to be able at full speed, and while suddenly turning about, to whirl them so steadily round the head, as to take aim, on foot any person would soon learn the art. One day, as I was amusing myself by galloping and whirling the balls round my head, by accident the free one struck a bush, and its revolving motion being thus destroyed, it immediately fell to the ground, and, like magic, caught one hind leg of my horse, the other ball was then jerked out of my hand, and the horse fairly secured. Luckily, he was an old practiced animal, and knew what it meant, otherwise he would probably have kicked till he had thrown himself down. The gauchos roared with laughter, they cried out that they had seen every sort of animal caught, but had never before seen a man caught by himself. During the two succeeding days, I reached the furthest point which I was anxious to examine. The country wore the same aspect, till at last the fine green turf became more wearisome than a dusty turnpike road. We everywhere saw great numbers of partridges, not Hura Major. These birds do not go in coveys, nor do they conceal themselves like the English kind. It appears a very silly bird. A man on horseback by riding round and round in a circle, or rather in a spire, so as to approach closer each time, may knock on the head as many as he pleases. The more common method is to catch them with a running noose, or little lazo, made of the stem of an ostrich's feather, fastened to the end of a long stick. A boy on a quiet old horse will frequently thus catch thirty or forty in a day. In Arctic North America the Indians catch the varying hair by walking spirally round and round it, when on its form, the middle of the day is reckoned the best time, when the sun is high, and the shadow of the hunter not very long. On our return to Maldonado, we followed rather a different line of road. Near Pandiazucar, a landmark well known to all those who have sailed up the Plata, I stayed a day at the house of a most hospitable old Spaniard. Early in the morning we ascended the Sierra de los Animas. By the aid of the rising sun the scenery was almost picturesque. To the westward the view extended over an immense level plain as far as the mount, at Monte Video, and to the eastward, over the mammillated country of Maldonado. On the summit of the mountain there were several small heaps of stones, which evidently had lain there for many years. My companion assured me that they were the work of the Indians in the old time. The heaps were similar, but on a much smaller scale, to those so commonly found on the mountains of Wales. The desire to signalize any event, on the highest point of the neighboring land, seems an universal passion with mankind. At the present day, not a single Indian, either civilized or wild, exists in this part of the province, nor am I aware that the former inhabitants have left behind them any more permanent records than these insignificant piles on the summit of the Sierra de los Animas. The general, and almost entire absence of trees in Banda Oriental is remarkable. Some of the rocky hills are partly covered by thickets, and on the banks of the larger streams, especially to the north of Las Minas, willow trees are not uncommon. Near the Arroyo tapes I heard of a wood of palms, and one of these trees, of considerable size, I saw near the Pan de Azucar, in latitude 35 degrees these, and the trees planted by the Spaniards, offer the only exceptions to the general scarcity of wood. Among the introduced kinds may be enumerated poplars, olives, peach, and other fruit trees, the peaches succeed so well, that they afford the main supply of firewood to the city of Buenos Aires. Extremely level countries, such as the Pampas, seldom appear favorable to the growth of trees. 
This may possibly be attributed either to the force of the winds, or the kind of drainage. In the nature of the land, however, around Maldonado, no such reason is apparent, the rocky mountains afford protected situations, enjoying various kinds of soil, streamlets of water are common at the bottoms of nearly every valley, and the clayey nature of the earth seems adapted to retain moisture. It has been inferred with much probability, that the presence of woodland is generally determined by the annual amount of moisture, yet in this province abundant and heavy rain falls during the winter, and the summer, though dry, is not so in any excessive degree. We see nearly the whole of Australia covered by lofty trees, yet that country possesses a far more arid climate. Hence, we must look to some other and unknown cause. Confining our view to South America, we should certainly be tempted to believe that trees flourished only under a very humid climate, for the limit of the forest land follows, in a most remarkable manner, that of the damp winds. In the southern part of the continent, where the western gales, charged with moisture from the Pacific, prevail, every island on the broken west coast, from latitude 38 degrees to the extreme point of Tierra del Fuego, is densely covered by impenetrable forests. On the eastern side of the Cordillera, over the same extent of latitude, where a blue sky and a fine climate prove that the atmosphere has been deprived of its moisture by passing over the mountains, the arid plains of Patagonia support a most scanty vegetation. In the more northern parts of the continent, within the limits of the constant southeastern trade wind, the eastern side is ornamented by magnificent forests, whilst the western coast, from latitude 4 degrees south to latitude 32 degrees south, may be described as a desert, on this western coast, northward of latitude 4 degrees south, where the trade wind loses its regularity, and heavy torrents of rain fall periodically, the shores of the Pacific, so utterly desert in Peru, assume near Cape Blanco the character of luxuriance so celebrated at Guayaquil and Panama. Hence in the southern and northern parts of the continent, the forest and desert lands occupy reversed positions with respect to the Cordillera, and these positions are apparently determined by the direction of the prevalent winds. In the middle of the continent there is a broad intermediate band, including central Chile and the provinces of La Plata, where the rain-bringing winds have not to pass over lofty mountains, and where the land is neither a desert nor covered by forests. But even the rule, if confined to South America, of trees flourishing only in a climate rendered humid by rain-bearing winds, has a strongly marked exception in the case of the Falkland Islands. These islands, situated in the same latitude with Tierra del Fuego and only between two and three hundred miles distant from it, having a nearly similar climate, with a geological formation almost identical, with favorable situations and the same kind of peaty soil, yet can boast of few plants deserving even the title of bushes, whilst in Tierra del Fuego it is impossible to find an acre of land not covered by the densest forest. In this case, both the direction of the heavy gales of wind and of the currents of the sea are favorable to the transport of seeds from Tierra del Fuego, as is shown by the canoes and trunks of trees drifted from that country, and frequently thrown on the shores of the western Falkland. Hence perhaps it is, that there are many plants in common to the two countries but with respect to the trees of Tierra del Fuego, even attempts made to transplant them have failed. During our stay at Maldonado I collected several quadrupeds, 80 kinds of birds, and many reptiles, including nine species of snakes. Of the indigenous mammalia, the only one now left of any size, which is common, is the service camp strees. This deer is exceedingly abundant, often in small herds, throughout the countries bordering the Plata and in northern Patagonia. If a person crawling close along the ground, slowly advances towards a herd, the deer frequently, out of curiosity, approach to reconnoiter him. I have by this means, killed from one spot, three out of the same herd. Although so tame and inquisitive, yet when approached on horseback, they are exceedingly wary. In this country nobody goes on foot, and the deer knows man as its enemy only when he is mounted and armed with the bullets. At Bahia Blanca, 
a recent establishment in northern Patagonia, I was surprised to find how little the deer cared for the noise of a gun, one day I fired ten times from within eighty yards at one animal, and it was much more startled at the ball cutting up the ground than at the report of the rifle. My powder being exhausted, I was obliged to get up, to my shame as a sportsman be it spoken, though well able to kill birds on the wing, and halloo till the deer ran away. The most curious fact with respect to this animal, is the overpoweringly strong and offensive odor which proceeds from the buck. It is quite indescribable, several times whilst skinning the specimen which is now mounted at the Zoological Museum, I was almost overcome by nausea. I tied up the skin in a silk pocket handkerchief, and so carried it home, this handkerchief, after being well washed, I continually used, and it was of course as repeatedly washed, yet every time, for a space of one year and seven months, when first unfolded, I distinctly perceived the odor. This appears an astonishing instance of the permanence of some matter, which nevertheless in its nature must be most subtle and volatile. Frequently, when passing at the distance of half a mile to leeward of a herd, I have perceived the whole air tainted with the effluvium. I believe the smell from the buck is most powerful at the period when its horns are perfect, or free from the hairy skin. When in this state the meat is, of course, quite uneatable, but the gauchos assert, that if buried for some time in fresh earth, the taint is removed. I have somewhere read that the Icelanders in the north of Scotland treat the rank carcasses of the fish-eating birds in the same manner. The order Rodentia is here very numerous in species, of mice alone I obtained no less than eight kinds. The largest gnawing animal in the world, the Hydrocaris capybara, the water hog, is here also common. One which I shot at Montevideo weighed 98 pounds, its length from the end of the snout to the stump-like tail, was 3 feet 2 inches, and its girth 3 feet 8. These great rodents occasionally frequent the islands in the mouth of the Plata, where the water is quite salt, but are far more abundant on the borders of freshwater lakes and rivers. Near Maldonado three or four generally live together. In the daytime they either lie among the aquatic plants, or openly feed on the turf plain. When viewed at a distance, from their manner of walking and color they resemble pigs, but when seated on their haunches, and attentively watching any object with one eye, they reassume the appearance of their congeners, cavies, and rabbits. Both the front and side view of their head has quite a ludicrous aspect, from the great depth of their jaw. These animals, at Maldonado, were very tame, by cautiously walking, I approached within three yards of four old ones. This tameness may probably be accounted for, by the jaguar having been banished for some years, and by the gaucho not thinking it worth his while to hunt them. As I approached nearer and nearer they frequently made their peculiar noise, which is a low abrupt grunt, not having much actual sound, but rather arising from the sudden expulsion of air, the only noise I know at all like it, is the first hoarse bark of a large dog. Having watched the four from almost within arm's length, and they me, for several minutes, they rushed into the water at full gallop with the greatest impetuosity, and emitted at the same time their bark. After diving a short distance they came again to the surface, but only just showed the upper part of their heads. When the female is swimming in the water, and has young ones, they are said to sit on her back. These animals are easily killed in numbers, but their skins are of trifling value, and the meat is very indifferent. On the islands in the Rio Piranha they are exceedingly abundant, and afford the ordinary prey to the jaguar. The tukutuko is a curious small animal, which may be briefly described as a gnawer, with the habits of a mole. It is extremely numerous in some parts of the country, but it is difficult to be procured, and never, I believe, comes out of the ground. It throws up at the mouth of its burrows hillocks of earth like those of the mole, but smaller. Considerable tracts of country are so completely undermined by these animals, that horses in passing over, sink above their fetlocks. The tukutukos appear, to a certain degree, to be gregarious, the man who procured the specimens for me had caught six together, and he said this was a common occurrence. 
They are nocturnal in their habits, and their principal food is the roots of plants, which are the object of their extensive and superficial burrows. This animal is universally known by a very peculiar noise which it makes when beneath the ground. A person, the first time he hears it, is much surprised, for it is not easy to tell whence it comes, nor is it possible to guess what kind of creature utters it. The noise consists in a short, but not rough, nasal grunt, which is monotonously repeated about four times in quick succession, the name Tukituko is given in imitation of the sound. Where this animal is abundant, it may be heard at all times of the day, and sometimes directly beneath one's feet. When kept in a room, the tukitukos move both slowly and clumsily, which appears owing to the outward action of their hind legs, and they are quite incapable, from the socket of the thigh bone not having a certain ligament, of jumping even the smallest vertical height. They are very stupid in making any attempt to escape. When angry or frightened they utter the tukituko. Of those I kept alive several, even the first day, became quite tame, not attempting to bite or to run away, others were a little wilder. The man who caught them asserted that very many are invariably found blind. A specimen which I preserved in spirits was in this state, Mr. Reed considers it to be the effect of inflammation in the nictitating membrane. When the animal was alive I placed my finger within half an inch of its head, and not the slightest notice was taken, it made its way, however, about the room nearly as well as the others. Considering the strictly subterranean habits of the Tukituko, the blindness, though so common, cannot be a very serious evil, yet it appears strange that any animal should possess an organ frequently subject to be injured. Lamarck would have been delighted with this fact had he known it, when speculating, probably with more truth than usual with him, on the gradually acquired blindness of the asphalax, a gnawer living underground, and of the proteuse, a reptile living in dark caverns filled with water, in both of which animals the eye is in an almost rudimentary state, and is covered by a tendinous membrane and skin. In the common mole the eye is extraordinarily small but perfect, Though many anatomists doubt whether it is connected with the true optic nerve, its vision must certainly be imperfect, though probably useful to the animal when it leaves its burrow. In the tukutuko, which I believe never comes to the surface of the ground, the eye is rather larger, but often rendered blind and useless, though without apparently causing any inconvenience to the animal, no doubt Lamarck would have said that the tukutuko is now passing into the state of the asphalax and proteus. Birds of many kinds are extremely abundant on the undulating, grassy plains around Maldonado. There are several species of a family allied in structure and manners to our starling, one of these, Molothrus niger, is remarkable from its habits. Several may often be seen standing together on the back of a cow or horse, and while perched on a hedge, pluming themselves in the sun, they sometimes attempt to sing, or rather to hiss the noise being very peculiar, resembling that of bubbles of air passing rapidly from a small orifice under water, so as to produce an acute sound. According to Azara, this bird, like the cuckoo, deposits its eggs in other birds' nests. I was several times told by the country people that there certainly is some bird having this habit, and my assistant in collecting, who is a very accurate person, found a nest of the sparrow of this country, with one egg in it larger than the others, and of a different color and shape. In North America there is another species of Molothrus, M. peccaris, which has a similar cuckoo-like habit, and which is most closely allied in every respect to the species from the plata, even in such trifling peculiarities as standing on the backs of cattle, it differs only in being a little smaller, and in its plumage and eggs being of a slightly different shade of color. This close agreement in structure and habits, in representative species coming from opposite quarters of a great continent, always strikes one as interesting, though of common occurrence. Mr. Swainson has well remarked, that with the exception of the Molothrus peccaries, to which must be added the M. niger, the cuckoos are the only birds which can be called truly parasitical, namely, such as fasten themselves, as it were, on another living animal whose animal heat brings their young into life, 
whose food they live upon, and whose death would cause theirs during the period of infancy. It is remarkable that some of the species, but not all, both of the cuckoo and molothrus, should agree in this one strange habit of their parasitical propagation, whilst opposed to each other in almost every other habit, the molothrus, like our starling, is eminently sociable, and lives on the open plains without art or disguise, the cuckoo, as everyone knows, is a singularly shy bird, it frequents the most retired thickets, and feeds on fruit and caterpillars. In structure also these two genera are widely removed from each other. Many theories, even phrenological theories, have been advanced to explain the origin of the cuckoo laying its eggs in other birds' nests. M. Prevost alone, I think, has thrown light by his observations on this puzzle, he finds that the female cuckoo, which, according to most observers, lays at least from four to six eggs, must pair with the male each time after laying only one or two eggs. Now, if the cuckoo was obliged to sit on her own eggs, she would either have to sit on all together, and therefore leave those first laid so long, that they probably would become adult, or she would have to hatch separately each egg, or two eggs, as soon as laid, but as the cuckoo stays a shorter time in this country than any other migratory bird, she certainly would not have time enough for the successive hatchings. Hence we can perceive in the fact of the cuckoo pairing several times, and laying her eggs at intervals, the cause of her depositing her eggs in other birds' nests, and leaving them to the care of foster parents. I am strongly inclined to believe that this view is correct, from having been independently led, as we shall hereafter see, to an analogous conclusion with regard to the South American ostrich, the females of which are parasitical, if I may so express it, on each other, each female laying several eggs in the nests of several other females, and the male ostrich undertaking all the cares of incubation, like the strange foster parents with the cuckoo. I will mention only two other birds, which are very common, and render themselves prominent from their habits. The Saurophagus sulfur ATUs is typical of the great American tribe of tyrant flycatchers. In its structure it closely approaches the true shrikes, but in its habits may be compared to many birds. I have frequently observed it, hunting a field, hovering over one spot like a hawk, and then proceeding on to another. When seen thus suspended in the air, it might very readily at a short distance be mistaken for one of the rapacious order, its stoop, however, is very inferior in force and rapidity to that of a hawk. At other times the saurophagus haunts the neighborhood of water, and there, like a kingfisher, remaining stationary, it catches any small fish which may come near the margin. These birds are not unfrequently kept either in cages or in courtyards, with their wings cut. They soon become tame, and are very amusing from their cunning odd manners, which were described to me as being similar to those of the common magpie. Their flight is undulatory, for the weight of the head and bill appears too great for the body. In the evening the saurophagus takes its stand on a bush, often by the roadside, and continually repeats without a change a shrill and rather agreeable cry, which somewhat resembles articulate words, the Spaniards say it is like the words Pietevio, I see you well, and accordingly have given it this name. A mocking bird, Mimus Orpheus, called by the inhabitants Calandria, is remarkable, from possessing a song far superior to that of any other bird in the country, indeed. It is nearly the only bird in South America which I have observed to take its stand for the purpose of singing. The song may be compared to that of the sedge warbler, but is more powerful, some harsh notes and some very high ones, being mingled with a pleasant warbling. It is heard only during the spring. At other times its cry is harsh and far from harmonious. Near Maldonado these birds were tame and bold. They constantly attended the country houses in numbers, to pick the meat which was hung up on the posts or walls, if any other small bird joined the feast, the calandria soon chased it away. On the white uninhabited plains of Patagonia another closely allied species, O. Patagonica of D. Orbini, which frequents the valleys clothed with spiny bushes, is a wilder bird, and has a slightly different tone of voice. It appears to me a curious circumstance, 
as showing the fine shades of difference in habits, that judging from this latter respect alone, when I first saw this second species, I thought it was different from the Maldonado kind. Having afterwards procured a specimen, and comparing the two without particular care, they appeared so very similar, that I changed my opinion, but now Mr. Gould says that they are certainly distinct, a conclusion in conformity with the trifling difference of habit, of which, of course, he was not aware. The number, tameness, and disgusting habits of the carrion feeding hawks of South America make them preeminently striking to anyone accustomed only to the birds of northern Europe. In this list may be included four species of the caracara or polyborus, the turkey buzzard, the gallinazo, and the condor. The caracaras are, from their structure, placed among the eagles, we shall soon see how ill they become so high a rank. In their habits they well supply the place of our carrion crows, magpies, and ravens, a tribe of birds widely distributed over the rest of the world, but entirely absent in South America. To begin with the Polyborus brasiliensis, this is a common bird, and has a wide geographical range, it is most numerous on the grassy savannas of La Plata, where it goes by the name of Carancha, and is far from unfrequent throughout the sterile plains of Patagonia. In the desert between the rivers Nagro and Colorado, numbers constantly attend the line of road to devour the carcasses of the exhausted animals which chance to perish from fatigue and thirst. Although thus common in these dry and open countries, and likewise on the arid shores of the Pacific, it is nevertheless found inhabiting the damp impervious forests of West Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego. The Carranchas, together with the Chimango, constantly attend in numbers the estancias and slaughtering houses. If an animal dies on the plain the Gallinazo commences the feast, and then the two species of polyborus pick the bones clean. These birds, although thus commonly feeding together, are far from being friends. When the carancha is quietly seated on the branch of a tree or on the ground, the chimango often continues for a long time flying backwards and forwards, up and down, in a semicircle, trying each time at the bottom of the curve to strike its larger relative. The carancha takes little notice, except by bobbing its head. Although the caranchas frequently assemble in numbers, they are not gregarious, for in desert places they may be seen solitary, or more commonly by pairs. The caranchas are said to be very crafty, and to steal great numbers of eggs. They attempt, also, together with the chimango, to pick off the scabs from the sore backs of horses and mules. The poor animal, on the one hand, with its ears down and its back arched, and, on the other, the hovering bird, eyeing at the distance of a yard the disgusting morsel, form a picture, which has been described by Captain Head with his own peculiar spirit and accuracy. These false eagles most rarely kill any living bird or animal, and their vulture-like, Necrophagous habits are very evident to anyone who has fallen asleep on the desolate plains of Patagonia, for when he wakes, he will see, on each surrounding hillock, one of these birds patiently watching him with an evil eye, it is a feature in the landscape of these countries, which will be recognized by everyone who has wandered over them. If a party of men go out hunting with dogs and horses, they will be accompanied, during the day, by several of these attendants. After feeding, the uncovered crop protrudes, at such times, and indeed generally, the carancha is an inactive, tame, and cowardly bird. Its flight is heavy and slow, like that of an English rook. It seldom soars, but I have twice seen one at a great height gliding through the air with much ease. It runs, in contradistinction to hopping, but not quite so quickly as some of its congeners. At times the carancha is noisy, but is not generally so, its cry is loud, very harsh, and peculiar, and may be likened to the sound of the Spanish guttural G, followed by a rough double RR, when uttering this cry it elevates its head higher and higher, till at last, with its beak wide open, the crown almost touches the lower part of the back. This fact, which has been doubted, is quite true. I have seen them several times with their heads backwards in a completely inverted position. To these observations I may add, on the high authority of Azara, 
that the carantia feeds on worms, shells, slugs, grasshoppers, and frogs, that it destroys young lambs by tearing the umbilical cord, and that it pursues the gallinazo, till that bird is compelled to vomit up the carrion it may have recently gorged. Lastly, Azara states that several carantias, five or six together, will unite in chase of large birds, even such as herons. All these facts show that it is a bird of very versatile habits and considerable ingenuity. The Polyborus chimango is considerably smaller than the last species. It is truly omnivorous, and will eat even bread, and I was assured that it materially injures the potato crops in Chile way, by stocking up the roots when first planted. Of all the carrion feeders it is generally the last which leaves the skeleton of a dead animal, and may often be seen within the ribs of a cow or horse, like a bird in a cage. Another species is the Polyborus novi zelandii, which is exceedingly common in the Falkland Islands. These birds in many respects resemble in their habits the carantias. They live on the flesh of dead animals and on marine productions, and on the Ramirez rocks their whole sustenance must depend on the sea. They are extraordinarily tame and fearless, and haunt the neighborhood of houses for awful. If a hunting party kills an animal, a number soon collect and patiently await, standing on the ground on all sides. After eating, their uncovered cross are largely protruded, giving them a disgusting appearance. They readily attack wounded birds, a cormorant in this state having taken to the shore, was immediately seized on by several, and its death hastened by their blows. The beagle was at the Falklands only during the summer, but the officers of the adventure, who were there in the winter, mention many extraordinary instances of the boldness and rapacity of these birds. They actually pounced on a dog that was lying fast asleep close by one of the party, and the sportsmen had difficulty in preventing the wounded geese from being seized before their eyes. It is said that several together, in this respect resembling the carantias, wait at the mouth of a rabbit hole, and together seize on the animal when it comes out. They were constantly flying on board the vessel when in the harbor, and it was necessary to keep a good lookout to prevent the leather being torn from the rigging, and the meat or game from the stern. These birds are very mischievous and inquisitive, they will pick up almost anything from the ground, a large black glazed hat was carried nearly a mile, as was a pair of the heavy balls used in catching cattle. Mr. Usborne experienced during the survey a more severe loss, in their stealing a small caterer's compass in a red Morocco leather case, which was never recovered. These birds are, moreover, quarrelsome and very passionate tearing up the grass with their bills from rage. They are not truly gregarious, they do not soar, and their flight is heavy and clumsy, on the ground they run extremely fast, very much like pheasants. They are noisy, uttering several harsh cries, one of which is like that of the English rook, hence the sealers always call them rooks. It is a curious circumstance that, when crying out, they throw their heads upwards and backwards, after the same manner as the Carantia. They build in the rocky cliffs of the sea coast, but only on the small adjoining islets, and not on the two main islands, this is a singular precaution in so tame and fearless a bird. The sealers say that the flesh of these birds, when cooked, is quite white, and very good eating, but bold must the man be who attempts such a meal. We have now only to mention the turkey buzzard, Vultar Aura, and the Gallinazo. The former is found wherever the country is moderately damp, from Cape Horn to North America. Differently from the Polyborus brasiliensis and Chimango, it has found its way to the Falkland Islands. The turkey buzzard is a solitary bird, or at most goes in pairs. It may at once be recognized from a long distance, by its lofty, soaring, and most elegant flight. It is well known to be a true carrion feeder. On the west coast of Patagonia, among the thickly wooded islets and broken land, it lives exclusively on what the sea throws up, and on the carcasses of dead seals. Wherever these animals are congregated on the rocks, there the vultures may be seen. The Gallinazo has a different range from the last species, 
as it never occurs southward of latitude 41 degrees Azara states that there exists a tradition that these birds, at the time of the conquest, were not found near Montevideo, but that they subsequently followed the inhabitants from more northern districts. At the present day they are numerous in the valley of the Colorado, which is 300 miles due south of Montevideo. It seems probable that this additional migration has happened since the time of Azara. The Galinezo generally prefers a humid climate, or rather the neighborhood of fresh water, hence it is extremely abundant in Brazil and La Plata, while it is never found on the desert and arid plains of northern Patagonia, excepting near some stream. These birds frequent the whole pampas to the foot of the Cordillera, but I never saw or heard of one in Chile, in Peru they are preserved as scavengers. These vultures certainly may be called gregarious, for they seem to have pleasure in society, and are not solely brought together by the attraction of a common prey. On a fine day a flock may often be observed at a great height, each bird wheeling round and round without closing its wings, in the most graceful evolutions. This is clearly performed for the mere pleasure of the exercise, or perhaps is connected with their matrimonial alliances. I have now mentioned all the carrion feeders, excepting the condor, an account of which will be more appropriately introduced when we visit a country more congenial to its habits than the plains of La Plata. In a broad band of sand hillocks which separate the Laguna del Potrero from the shores of the Plata, at the distance of a few miles from Maldonado, I found a group of those vitrified, silicious tubes, which are formed by lightning entering loose sand. These tubes resemble in every particular those from Drig in Cumberland, described in the geological transactions. The sand hillocks of Maldonado, not being protected by vegetation, are constantly changing their position. From this cause the tubes projected above the surface, and numerous fragments lying near, showed that they had formerly been buried to a greater depth. Four sets entered the sand perpendicularly, by working with my hands I traced one of them two feet deep, and some fragments which evidently had belonged to the same tube, when added to the other part, measured five feet three inches. The diameter of the whole tube was nearly equal, and therefore we must suppose that originally it extended to a much greater depth. These dimensions are however small, compared to those of the tubes from Drig, one of which was traced to a depth of not less than 30 feet. The internal surface is completely vitrified, glossy, and smooth. A small fragment examined under the microscope appeared, from the number of minute entangled air or perhaps steam bubbles, like an assay fused before the blowpipe. The sand is entirely, or in greater part, silicious, but some points are of a black color, and from their glossy surface possess a metallic luster. The thickness of the wall of the tube varies from a thirtieth to a twentieth of an inch, and occasionally even equals a tenth. On the outside the grains of sand are rounded, and have a slightly glazed appearance, I could not distinguish any signs of crystallization. In a similar manner to that described in the geological transactions, the tubes are generally compressed, and have deep longitudinal furrows, so as closely to resemble a shriveled vegetable stalk, or the bark of the elm or cork tree. Their circumference is about two inches, but in some fragments, which are cylindrical and without any furrows, it is as much as four inches. The compression from the surrounding loose sand, acting while the tube was still softened from the effects of the intense heat, has evidently caused the creases or furrows. Judging from the uncompressed fragments, the measure, or bore of the lightning, if such a term may be used, must have been about one inch and a quarter. At Paris, M. Hachette and M. Boudin succeeded in making tubes, in most respects similar to these fulgaites, by passing very strong shocks of galvanism through finely powdered glass, when salt was added, so as to increase its fusibility, the tubes were larger in every dimension. They failed both with powdered felspa and quartz. One tube, formed with pounded glass, was very nearly an inch long, namely 0.982, and had an internal diameter of 0.019 of an inch. When we hear that the strongest battery in Paris was used, 
and that its power on a substance of such easy fusibility as glass was to form tubes so diminutive, we must feel greatly astonished at the force of a shock of lightning, which, striking the sand in several places, has formed cylinders, in one instance of at least thirty feet long, and having an internal bore, where not compressed, of full an inch and a half, and this in a material so extraordinarily refractory as quartz. The tubes, as I have already remarked, enter the sand nearly in a vertical direction. One, however, which was less regular than the others, deviated from a right line, at the most considerable bend, to the amount of 33 degrees. From this same tube, two small branches, about a foot apart, were sent off, one pointed downwards, and the other upwards. This latter case is remarkable, as the electric fluid must have turned back at the acute angle of 26 degrees, to the line of its main course. Besides the four tubes which I found vertical, and traced beneath the surface, there were several other groups of fragments, the original sites of which without doubt were near. All occurred in a level area of shifting sand, 60 yards by 20, situated among some high sand hillocks, and at the distance of about half a mile from a chain of hills four or five hundred feet in height. The most remarkable circumstance, as it appears to me, in this case as well as in that of Drig, and in one described by M. Ribbentrop in Germany, is the number of tubes found within such limited spaces. At Drig, within an area of fifteen yards, three were observed, and the same number occurred in Germany. In the case which I have described, certainly more than four existed within the space of the sixty by twenty yards. As it does not appear probable that the tubes are produced by successive distinct shocks, we must believe that the lightning, shortly before entering the ground, divides itself into separate branches. The neighborhood of the Rio Plata seems peculiarly subject to electric phenomena. In the year 1793, one of the most destructive thunderstorms perhaps on record happened at Buenos Aires, 37 places within the city were struck by lightning, and 19 people killed. From facts stated in several books of travels, I am inclined to suspect that thunderstorms are very common near the mouths of great rivers. Is it not possible that the mixture of large bodies of fresh and salt water may disturb the electrical equilibrium? Even during our occasional visits to this part of South America, we heard of a ship, two churches, and a house having been struck. Both the church and the house I saw shortly afterwards, the house belonged to Mr. Hood, the consul general at Montevideo. Some of the effects were curious, the paper, for nearly a foot on each side of the line where the bell wires had run, was blackened. The metal had been fused and although the room was about 15 feet high, the globules, dropping on the chairs and furniture, had drilled in them a chain of minute holes. A part of the wall was shattered, as if by gunpowder, and the fragments had been blown off with force sufficient to dent the wall on the opposite side of the room. The frame of a looking glass was blackened, and the gilding must have been volatilized, for a smelling bottle, which stood on the chimney piece, was coated with bright metallic particles, which adhered as firmly as if they had been enameled. In South America I collected altogether 27 species of mice, and 13 more are known from the works of Azara and other authors. Those collected by myself have been named and described by Mr. Waterhouse at the meetings of the Zoological Society. I must be allowed to take this opportunity of returning my cordial thanks to Mr. Waterhouse, and to the other gentlemen attached to that society, for their kind and most liberal assistance on all occasions. In the stomach and duodenum of a capybara which I opened I found a very large quantity of a thin yellowish fluid, in which scarcely a fiber could be distinguished. Mr. Owen informs me that a part of the esophagus is so constructed that nothing much larger than a crow quill can be passed down. Certainly, the broad teeth and strong jaws of this animal are well fitted to grind into pulp the aquatic plants on which it feeds. At the R. Negro, in northern Patagonia, there is an animal of the same habits, and probably a closely allied species, but which I never saw. Its noise is different from that of the Maldonado kind, 
it is repeated only twice instead of three or four times, and is more distinct and sonorous, when heard from a distance it so closely resembles the sound made in cutting down a small tree with an axe, that I have sometimes remained in doubt concerning it.